Thanks for choosing to worship God with us here at St. Mark's United Methodist Church. Uh, as we gather together this morning, I hope you received a bulletin as you walked in full of activities and events that are taking place in the life of our church. I'll lift up some of those to you this morning. This afternoon at 3.30, don't forget our children and their families are invited to a Lenten prayer fair. Uh, this is going to be a fun, interactive way to, for you and your children to uh, learn about the season of Lent and why we celebrate that in the life of the church and how it prepares us for Easter. Uh, I'm told that there are still a few places available. If, if your child and or family would like to participate, you can sign up at the Welcome Center uh, a little later on. Uh, I want to also lift up our Ash Wednesday service that will be this Wednesday evening at 6.15. If you'd like to join us for a meal prior to that, it's at 5.15, and you can sign up for the meal uh, on the attendance pads when we pass those down a little later. If you've already signed up uh, for our meal, then you don't need to sign up again. I want to make you aware that our Next Steps class begins next Sunday. This is for people who'd like to know more about St. Mark's United Methodist Church, uh, about the United Methodist Church in general. It's a way for you to meet some of our leaders and to hear some of the ministries that are taking place here in the life of the church and give you an opportunity to get involved. And so if that interests you, please plan to join uh, the Reverend Dr. Jim Clardy in the banquet room next Sunday morning. Is that right? Banquet room during the Sunday school hour. Also, we've got lots of Lenten studies throughout the church in our Christian education ministry, and some of those are like uh, focusing on Les Mis, the grace of Les Mis, why Easter matters. Uh, you've seen some of those uh, things on the screen as you were gathering here this morning. Uh, you can find more information about those in the narthex as well. Our flowers today are placed in memory of Cecil Sweeney, and they're given by Thomas and Connie Reed and by James Frank Reed and Faye Reed, and so we thank you for these flowers. And then our candle this morning that we light, representing the ministry of another church in our community, is for Zion Christian Ministries and their leader, Christopher Johnson. We begin each week by reminding ourselves of, of a prayer that I've invited you to pray with me for 2020. Uh, would you join with me together? God, we pledge to worship regularly, grow spiritually, serve sacrificially, commit to excellence, grow in our sense of God's purpose, and creatively express our faith. Uh, as the prelude begins, let you and I be preparing our minds and hearts to worship God. Thank you. 
Good morning. Please stand as you're able and join me in our opening prayer. Light of God, shine upon us in this hour. We come to you as we are, in our strength and in our weakness. Bless our world in all its beauty and in all its pain with your Spirit's redeeming power. As you transfigured Jesus on a mountaintop, transform us as we worship you today. Touch us with the presence of your Spirit that we may shine Christ's light into a world longing for peace. Amen. what we believe, we can affirm our faith to them and to God by saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Turn to those around you and offer words and signs of Christ's peace. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Up here. I am getting better at getting yes.
Hear the word of God as it is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses one through nine. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. As he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time, the children are invited to come forward for the children's message. Following the children's message, the children are invited to pick up a worship bag to use in the pews and continue worshiping with us here in the sanctuary. kind of funny. Why are y'all looking at me so funny? I got a Santa hat on you. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not Christmas. Is that it? Raise your hand if you wish it could be Christmas every day. Yes. Yes. Oh, because Christmas, you can put your hand down now. Christmas is so wonderful. We get to celebrate Jesus' birthday, and, and there's so many beautiful decorations and yummy food and beautiful songs in the church, and, and maybe we'll give presents and maybe we'll get presents. It's just such a wonderful time, right? Right? Yeah, 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 but you know what? It can't be Christmas every day, can it? No, it can't. It can't, but you know what? Even though it's not Christmas, it, even though it's not Christmas, even though it's not Christmas every day, it can still be special. It can still be really good. I, because, you know, God still loves us in those times. And we have lots of blessings. So even though it's not Christmas, other days, all the other days can be really good. In between the Christmases and, and the Easter's and our birthdays, you know, because those are just a few days, but the other days are good too, and it's that way with God. Sometimes, sometimes we feel so close to God, and we can feel God's love, and we feel like he is right there with us, and, and it just feels so good. And, but that's not every day. Sometimes that happens, but most of the time are just normal Sundays in February, right? But even on a normal Sunday in February, God loves us just as much. And Jesus is there to forgive us of our sins just as much. And the Holy Spirit is here to remind us and to guide us and lead us. And, and so God is always with us, even on the, the big, wonderful, big emotion days and the normal everyday days. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. And then, and then if you're under three, you get one of these little things. But if you're three or over, you get to have a blowy out thing. And whenever you play with this thing and you think about celebrating, I want you to remember that God's with us on the big days and on the normal days. But do not play with these until after church. Okay. Let's bow our head. 
Dear Heavenly Father, help us to help us to treasure all the days with you, dear Lord. Dear Lord, thank you for the big days when you feel so close to us, and thank you for all the other days. Remind us that you are just as close to us, loving us every minute. In Jesus' name, let's all say Amen. Okay. Well, today's uh, sermon scripture is Matthew uh, chapters uh, 17, verses 1 through 9, and the title of the sermon is Mountaintops and Valleys. Uh, don't know if you've heard yet, but I'm engaged. I've never been able to get you to clap for my sermon, at least you'll clap in it, so thank you for that, I appreciate that. Um, so I guess that means I could sort of start telling stories about my fiance, right? Uh, she says she listens to the podcast, we'll find that out this week, won't we? Well, several months ago, we were, on, we were uh, hiking up a mountain, we were a part of this big large group, uh, we love to hike, and so we're on our way hiking up this big mountain. This group that we're a part of, we don't know anybody else in the group. And so we're just kind of starting our way up the mountain when all of a sudden I hear something behind me. It's a a family, a husband and wife, their three children. And one of the children has started to complain already about the hike that we're taking. Talking about that there's too many bugs and that there is too long and it's too tired and and that it's just not going to be worth it and so uh, at first the parents were really trying to be encouraging to the children you know when when the child said well I'm going to get bitten by bugs uh, they said well look we sprayed you with bug spray so the bugs aren't going to bother you son and and then when he said well it's too hot they pointed out that well most of the journey up this particular mountain is going to be in the shade and so the heat won't be that much of a factor and when he was talking about how tired he was and how long it was going to take they said you're a big boy you're gonna do fine up this mountain and when you get to the top you're going to be so glad that you made the journey well the boy just kept complaining and so after a while those words of encouragement from the parents to the child changed just a little bit to more stern statements and it got so bad that at some point I looked back and the father was on his knees saying listen to me stop complaining you're going to enjoy this once you get to the top Well, I was thinking about that story as I was reading the scripture lesson from this morning. You see, Jesus has invited James and Peter and John to go hike up a mountain. And the mountains are no easier for them than it was for this family and those small children. You know, it could have been really hot that day. It could have been unseasonably cold that day. It could have been raining for the whole month of February like it feels like it's done here in Tennessee. It it could have been that the path was really slick. It could have been that the path was overgrown with brush. It could have been that unlike on the hike that I was on, that there weren't some well-placed steps that would help you and some well-placed handrails to, to help you to get up to the top of that mountain. 
Do you think for an instance that maybe as they were hiking up this mountain that some people got a little frustrated? That some people began to complain? That, that, that some people began to say things to like Jesus like, it is too hot to be howling up this mountain right now. Or it is too cold. Or the bugs are terrible. Or I just don't know if I've got enough energy to get to the top. I suspect that all of those things might have been possible. And can you imagine that at first Jesus was saying, hey, come on, Peter, James, and John, I promise you when you get to the top, it's going to be worth it. But if they kept complaining or they kept getting frustrated, can't you just see Jesus at some point saying, listen, stop complaining. When you get to the top of this mountain, it's going to be worth it, I promise And then what about all of those other disciples, the other nine that are not a part of this particular journey? Were they jealous because Peter and James and John got to go all the way up to the top of the mountain with Jesus while they did not? Or were they actually relieved? (laughs) Man, it is hot as Hades out here. I ain't going up that mountain. I am so glad that I get to stay here at the bottom with the rest of you. We'll kick back on the Sea of Galilee. We'll go out on the boat, fish a wild man. We are going to have the time of our lives while they complain all the way up that mountain. Or maybe, maybe they were invited to go and they just decided, I'm not going to go. They didn't know what was going to happen at the top of that mountain. Maybe they just had other things to do, more important things in their mind. And so maybe they just said, you know what, y'all go ahead. We're just going to stay down here at the bottom and take care of things. Maybe Jesus asked the three of them, Peter, James, and John, to go up on the top of that mountain that day because when Moses encountered God on the top of Mount Sinai, it's recorded in the Old Testament, Moses only had three people with him. Maybe Jesus chose these three because they were his closest friends of all the twelve. He just sort of clicked or connected with these three more than anybody else. Maybe he chose them because they were a part of the inner circle. The gifts and graces that they had were important to Jesus as he was living into his call and doing the will of God. Maybe the reason why he chose these three disciples, because according to the Gospels, they are three of the earliest followers of Jesus. They are three of the first people who heard the call of God upon their lives and were willing to say yes and follow Jesus. But Matthew really doesn't tell us why these three were chosen. All we know is that they go up on this high mountain, which would not have been easy. And they didn't really know what they were going to expect, or at least we don't know that they, did, that they knew. And maybe it was, they just went. And it was such an incredible once-in-a-lifetime experience once they arrived at the top of the mountain. Well, once they arrive at the top of the mountain, Matthew says that Jesus' face began to shine like the sun. And that was uh, something amazing to them. And I find it fascinating here that even though Jesus has already told these disciples that he's going to eventually have to go to Jerusalem, that he's going to eventually have to suffer greatly, and that he will eventually die and be raised from the dead, Jesus doesn't have to wait until he gets to the cross to be glorified. You see, Jesus knew that he was going to be glorified once he was crucified and then raised from the dead. But even in this moment, before all of that stuff happens, Jesus is still being glorified. Not only does his face shine like the sun, not only do his clothes become dazzling white, not only is this cloud come above them and a voice from the cloud that uh, essentially confirms and affirms Jesus as the Son of God. He is being glorified in this very moment even as he will ultimately be glorified when he's raised from the dead. 
And we're told that after his face shines this, gr- this brilliant white, shining like the sun, that, that Moses and Elijah show up. Now Moses and Elijah were two of the most well-known figures in the Jewish faith. They're two of the most prominent people talked about in the Old Testament. Moses is the one that God chose to give the people the law. And, and then Elijah was the one that God chose as the forerunner of the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. Uh, Moses and Elijah both had their own encounters with God up on the top of a high mountain. Moses, when he was there to receive the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, and Elijah, when he was on top of the mountain, Mount Horeb. Both of these, Moses and Elijah, had unique endings to their earthly lives. You might remember, Elijah, we're told, just just swept up into heaven without even dying. And, and, And Moses, while we're told that he dies, they never could find his body, and they never could find where he's buried. And so are some of the early rabbis... Of, of, of after that story was told and priests began to say that perhaps Moses himself was taken straight into heaven just like Elijah. And you might remember that Moses' face when he encountered God on Mount Sinai began to shine like the sun. There are so many similarities here. If you don't know anything else, you know that the fact that Jesus is now in the presence of these two great Old Testament figures, it really shows you that Jesus is the real deal. There's something great about this Jesus because he's being seen with these two great icons of the faith. Well, then Peter, always a man of action, a man who can't stand silence, a man who's always going to fill the silence by doing something or saying something, he suggests to Jesus that they should just build three tents, three booths, three shelters, three dwelling places, one for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for Jesus. Now, we're not told why Peter wants to do this. Maybe because he sees those three icons in the faith and he thinks that we should build a memorial to these three people fitting of their stature in our faith tradition. Maybe that's why Peter said that they should build those three tents or dwelling places. Maybe he wanted to build those three booths because he was reminded of in the Old Testament whenever Israel wanted to commemorate something special that God was doing, they would engage in what they called the festival of booths. Maybe the reason why Peter wanted to build those three things there that day is because Jesus had already told them that he was going to have to leave and go to Jerusalem. And there he would suffer and he would die. And and Peter doesn't want that to happen. He's already told Jesus that it can't happen. And he just wants to delay that suffering and death a little longer by staying there on the mountaintop. Or maybe Peter suggests that they build those three things because this is absolutely one of the coolest, most spiritual experiences he's ever had in his entire life. And he doesn't want this mountaintop experience to ever end. He just wants to stay there and he just wants to enjoy it as long as possible. When we're told all of a sudden this big cloud appears. Big clouds in scripture are always reminiscent of God's presence. You might remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai that the cloud of God's presence came upon him. You might remember that that same cloud of God's presence is the one that led the Israelites as they wandered around in the desert for 40 years. You might know that that same cloud of presence we're told is what filled the tabernacle with God's presence. We we might know that that same cloud of presence is the one when Solomon built the temple, filled the temple. There always in the history of our religious tradition, clouds have represented the presence of God. And so here this presence of God comes across Jesus and all of those that are gathered there and there's a voice. And the voice says, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
Moses and Elijah, they are really, really important. It's as if God is saying. But this man, Jesus, is going to come and offer a new perspective. He's going to fill in some of the blanks that maybe you, you, you haven't gotten the answers to yet. Listen to him. Well, then at this sound, the three uh, disciples, Peter, James, and John fall face down to the ground in fear. That too is not surprising at all. Whenever there is evidence of God's presence in Scripture, it is usually followed by this sense of reverence and awe and fear of the Holy One. And so in the midst of that, uh, Jesus walks up and He touches those three disciples. This is my favorite part of the story. Because after you've just witnessed Jesus turn, his face shines like the sun, his clothes turn dazzling white, he's talking with two pioneers of the faith, the voice of God has spoken and said, this is my son. They might have wondered if this human Jesus that they had walked with and journeyed with throughout their time together had now lost some of his humanity and now was assuming his full divinity and Maybe that touch, that human touch, is what drew them back to know that this is the same Jesus who has hugged us and walked with us and touched us along the way as we have sought to follow Him. And then we're told that they look up and Moses and Elijah are gone. It's as if God is saying to them, Moses and Elijah were absolutely important. They're absolutely pioneers of the faith. But what they were doing is their roles of the law and the prophets is they were preparing the way for Jesus. And now that Jesus is here, you no longer need Elijah and Moses. They've done what they came to do. Your singular focus from this point on should only be on Jesus the Christ. Despite Peter's suggestion that they stay there and enjoy that time together, Matthew says that they had to go back down the mountain. And they still didn't understand. Peter would go on to deny Jesus three times. All of the other disciples would end up deserting Jesus in the moment when he was arrested. It's as if God wanted us to know that just because you have a mountaintop experience with God doesn't make you a better or more faithful disciple of Jesus. And what it also suggests that if there are those of us here this morning like the other nine disciples who didn't have a mountaintop experience, that doesn't make you any less or worse of a disciple. And so then Jesus tells them that they should not tell anyone what has happened because Jesus is aware that they still don't quite understand what must take place? Church, I'd like to suggest to you that following Jesus is not easy. I mean, it's a lot like a mountain hike up a big mountain. Sometimes you wonder if it's worth it. Sometimes you wonder if you've got the energy to keep going. Sometimes you wonder why there are so many bugs and distractions in life. So many things that could draw us away from what we might experience if we could just stay focused. Uh, sometimes you get a mountaintop experience. Many times you don't get a mountaintop experience. What is going on? And even if you do get a mountaintop experience, they don't ever last very long. And, it, and you enjoy the mountaintop experience for just a little while. But then just like Jesus and the disciples, you find yourself headed back down into the valleys of life. Where most of life is lived as a follower of Jesus. Even Jesus knew what it was like to be on a mountain where he was in the presence of God one moment 
and then back in the valleys in a time of suffering and on his way to the cross in the next moment. But the good news is this. That Jesus goes with us into those valleys. He knows what it's like to leave a mountaintop experience. And then go through suffering. And go to the way of the cross. And he knows that for us. When the Christian journey gets difficult. When we too experience suffering. When things don't go the way that we would like. Or in the way that we would hope. He can relate. But it was because of Jesus. That when we go through the way of suffering. Even the way of the cross. Still new life awaits. Let us pray. Lord, there may be some of us here this morning that have experienced mountaintop encounters with you like the three disciples did. And there may be many others here like the nine who've never had such an encounter. Following you is not easy. You never said that it would be. But you did invite us not to be afraid. Because you knew even the way of the cross leads to life. Help us to claim that promise for ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as you're able for our hymn of response. Alleluia, alleluia. you to be in prayer with us for those who have asked us to remember them. First of all, we have a team that will be going to Jackson, Mississippi, leaving tomorrow to assist with the cleanup after the flooding 
and all the devastation that's there. They've asked for our prayers. Also, uh, this morning, we want to remember uh, Sandra Childress, and that's Misty Ferguson's mother. Also, uh, Roland Edwards is scheduled for surgery on uh, Friday, so let's keep them all in our prayers. You know, uh, the church triumphant is richer this week because of so many who have left us. And I want to just ask you to continue to be in prayer for the family of Norma Bennett, uh, for Patty Dawes and her family and the passing of your mother, uh, Nancy Wagner. The services for Herman Johnson will be here in this sanctuary today at 2 o'clock. And the services for Ken Creed will be at the Murfreesboro Funeral Home today at uh, 3 o'clock as well. And the funeral for Sue Jones will be here on Tuesday in this sanctuary at 1 o'clock. And we ask you to be in prayer for the family and friends of Jerry Davis, who was uh, an associate pastor here at, at one time. And also, uh, we've been asked to pray for the family of uh, Jeff, uh, well, Jeff and uh, um, Natalie Porter. They lost their uh, two-year-old daughter uh, uh, this week, and they're close friends of uh, and neighbors of members in the congregation. And then also, we want to extend our sympathies to uh, Mike Warren and the scouts and the passing of a very special Eagle Scout of a few years ago from our troop by the name of Brandon uh, Taylor. He was uh, lost his life in an automobile accident. Let us pray. Dear God, we come here today because you are here. We thank you for the mountaintops, which are places of revelation, inspiration, and exhilaration. Yes, we confess that at times we get so carried away that we resist the call back to the valley. And yet you gently remind us that the mountaintop is not a permanent resident. So help us to be thankful for the valley. Help us to live faithfully and hopefully and obediently in the valley where the day-to-day subtleties of life bring us to the reality of real existence. And thank you for the fact that in the valley you restore our souls. So be with each of us today, wherever we may be, mountain, valley, ocean, river, in the sun, in the snow, the rain, wherever we are. And bless all those who are going through hard times. And for those for whom the road is smooth, thank you as well. Through one who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We invite the ushers to come forward at this time and we'll receive our morning offering and would remind you to please take this moment to pass those attendance pads back down the aisle so that we might have a record of your presence here today. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this community of faith and the way that they seek to live out their faith in this community in our world. We're mindful that the gifts given today help to spread the good news of your great love. And so we ask you to bless these gifts that they might be used faithfully and according to your will. And we ask you to bless every person here today with a special sense of your peace and your presence. Amen.
invitation for you today is to simply follow Jesus. Sometimes following Jesus is not always easy. It takes us places that we don't want to go. And sometimes when we get there, we're not sure that it was worth it. Uh, but uh, the promise that Jesus gives us in the scripture today is that even the way of suffering, even the way of death because of Jesus can lead to life. I'm praying that you have one of those mountaintop experiences, but if you don't, it doesn't mean that you're less of a disciple or that God loves you less. Even those who've had mountaintop experiences uh, don't always get it right. Uh, let's acclaim the promise of God and the presence of God in our lives as we sing together. <laughs>
Amen.